Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Knocked Conscious with Mark Poles. Today, I'm going to be presenting the second half of my conversation with Jeff Hester, astrophysicist and person very famously connected to the Hubble Space Telescope. So here's the second half of that conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. We talk about control. I mean, debt, debt is the way that we are controlled. That's the number one way. Yeah. Number two is, is our reliance on other, on a definitely natural utilities, yeah. natural monopolies, yeah. uh, uti- you know, energy being a key component yeah. to that. And the thing is, is that there are, this, this now gets off into the economics of it. Um, I, markets can be really very efficient. There are a lot of places where, by golly, markets are the right thing. There are other places that satisfy precisely none of the assumptions that you have to satisfy if you want market solutions to be good solutions. Power is one of them. Medical care is another. You know, you look, for example, at medical care. There is no flexibility of demand for medical care. You know, if I've got cancer, I'm going to go get treated. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's not like, oh, I've got this big market and I'm going to get. No, I'm going to go and try to find the best care I can because my life is on the line. And so the idea that free markets are the right solution to medical care is absurd. The rest of the civilized, well, okay, the rest of the Western world and a fair bit of Asia has figured that out, which is how they managed to provide uh, medical care with a substantially higher effectiveness for a small fraction of what we spend for medical care. Um, but again, there's this, there is this relig- and it truly is. It, I mean, this religious devotion to the idea that that you know somehow free markets are the the solution to absolutely everything that cause us as a society to do ourselves tremendous damage in the service of this concept, this notion that we have committed ourselves to, which takes us back to the earlier part of the conversation. Um, yeah. I, but on, on that point though, and, and, and it's not I'm not that I'm pro or con on this on say universal health care for example, but like couldn't we attack the efficiencies of the system first because it seems like there is a lot of that extra cost right just where in, in where topic, right? okay but attacking can we hit it on no I'm just saying can we hit it from both sides like hit it from the t- together side right to to take it away from that free market and a and make it more efficient. But in a way. The, the two are the same, are two heads of the same coin. Because once you start saying we're going to have some kind of an organized effort to, uh, to improve the efficiency, to change the system, then, okay, you're saying that we're now stepping in and interfering with market solutions. Because let's face it, I, if you you know you're in big pharma you're in you're in health insurance you're in you know hospital whatever where the heck are the market incentives to bring down costs right they don't exist absolutely none you know, no no there's no that's is the it? point right the, those cards are stacked against you to yeah. do that for example how is it that we managed in well less than a year to produce multiple vaccines, very effective vaccines for COVID, using technologies that seem to just appear out of nowhere. Well, the reason is, is that the research had already been done. People knew how to do this. I mean, they they had not developed it to this point. But no, there yeah, was scale for but, sure. But there was no market for it. No, not at all. And now the M- all of the, a sudden, you're, and you're talking about the mRNA, basically, yes, right? The way, yeah. the God, way that's of getting cool stuff. Right. It it's pretty impressive. It is. It is pretty impressive. But it was not a big 
you know, economic driver and therefore, um, you know, there's no money in producing vaccines. And so they were trying to use this to, to cure cancer and things like that. And then along comes this huge market and all of a sudden, six months later, less than six months later, they are cranking out vaccines like nobody's business because now they had the incentive. Another one, and this is a big one, turns out that antibiotics, that there is not a lot of market incentive to produce antibiotics. And as a result, there's not a lot of antibiotic research going on. And, but what is happening is that we're seeing more and more and more antibiotic resistant uh Right. You know, the MRSA, MRSA and everything. Yeah. Right. How many times can you take a Z pack, for example? You're exactly. not supposed to take it every time because no. that resistance get built. I mean, right. there's your evolution, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Just, evolution is exactly where bacteria finds those resistance. Exactly. Uh, and man, uh, bacteria is bacteria impressive. evolves <laughs> the the mechanisms that bacteria has evolved, the epigenetic mechanisms to 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 do things like develop resistance is extraordinary. You know, bacteria get together every so often and say, let's exchange plasmids. You know, I've, I've evolved all of these responses and you've re evolved all of those responses. And we're simple enough that we can just pass those around. So you just communicate to each other, exactly. just like mind yeah. meld, basically. You just put the little fingers on the forehead and yeah. you're good to go. Yeah, good to go. Pass around wow. your genetic stuff. And that is, I mean, and, I mean yeah. how, do, how does that system become, how does it do that? How does it become so efficient? How does that exist? It, it is so fascinating. I know, but that's, how does, how is evolution? It's so fascinating. How? But again, you know? evolution, once you wrap Beautiful. your head around evolution, it's like, oh, Evolution is this, it's an algorithm. It's a process. Oh, it makes total sense. But just, and it is incredibly efficient. It is incredibly efficient. And it's, it's efficient everywhere that you put it to use. And it's really kind of cool. One of the things that if you pay attention, one of the things that is happening to a lot of technologies is they are developing a more and more organic feel, including organic appearance quite often. And the reason for that is that we're building things, we're, we're quote, designing things that completely defy traditional design principles, except we're defining them through evolution and evolution finds solutions that are wildly more efficient but that no engineer would ever come up with using you know traditional design methods and that's you know again ultimately it's what we're talking about here is also what underlies ai you know how is it how is it that um that alpha go managed to completely embarrass the best go player in the world um, at a game, and then that, Alpha Zero beat it, right? Yeah, and the the you know the the AlphaGo, I think they said in four hours became the best chess player on the planet. Yeah, I um, I I did a podcast on it, and AlphaGo beat the best chess yeah. player or the best Go, Go, Go player. player. I think it was like was it five to one, something like that? No, Four it was to one, five something. to zero. He five never to zero. he never touched right. It. And then there was like a move 33 or move 37. That was a, yeah. something that it calculated only one in 10,000 probability of making that move. Yep. And it did that. So it showed yep. a definite creativity, yep. but then it created the alpha zero, which the alpha go was fed all of the play, all of the games ever played where alpha zero was only told the rules yep. and played itself. Yep. And then that beat alpha go yep. like a hundred to nothing. Yeah. I mean, it is unbelievable. Yeah. And it's and it is just that algorithm. Oh, yeah, and, the, organic, and the, what is that called? Machine learning now? Is that well, technically it, what it's it is, called? It or? is machine learning. They talk about deep learning. They talk about neural nets. They talk, you know, deep learning is the term that often gets used. But at its core, 
it is it is an evolutionary all, all of these machine learning algorithms are at their core evolutionary algorithms they're algorithms where you you take various parts of the system and you tweak them in random ways and you compare outputs and on the basis of those outputs you choose how you're going to do the tweaking and it learns quickly and it learns quickly you know when we you learn, look at social media yeah. it, it'll uh, say it'll say it'll try to attract people and to a group yep. and it'll get three people the first time it will tweak to the point it'll get seven the next yep. and 23 the next yep. and it just finds ways yep. to get in yep. to your to your attention right obviously the algorithm is written for attention so yeah. attention in this case would be resources in another case or some yeah. other, something else yeah. right but underlying all of it underlying all of those kinds of technologies is ultimately the algorithm of evolution, ultimately that idea. And the consequences of that are going to be kind of astounding. You know, it in through history, when there have been technological advances, it has typically been blue collar workers that have been the ones that have been impacted by that. You know, they bring in they bring in the automated machines that can build cars and you know they, they do things like that what's yeah, going I mean, on heck the car itself yeah. i mean help with yeah. deliveries and transportation and and the logistics of the of the country i'm sure but what's going on right now the the next big thing that is happening isn't something that's about displacing blue collar workers it's about displacing white collar workers for example doctors um as I forget who it was, but they made the comment that if Watson is not already the best diagnostician on the planet, that it won't be long before it is. <clears throat> and, and it can see, you know, for example, like the ocular can see how many different shades of gray for to spot tumors earlier yep. on an X-ray. You've got those then, kinds the, of things. Yeah. You know, then then the human eye, because we're limited. Yeah. We are. We are very limited. And machines are getting very good at language use, whether people know it or not. It's already the case that you will pick up magazine articles that were actually written by AIs. Um, you know, their news stories are written by AIs these days. It's funny. I actually have a little stash account uh -huh. and I think I put $5 in it a week just to play with it. Yep. And I do it. I have it invested in AI's top picks and it's up like 30%, 28 some percent. Oh man. It's going to, it's going to explode. I mean, it's it, just, and you're just like, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's it, ideally predictive it's not reactionary at all right it, exactly it's unbelievably predictive because the patterns are there yeah and it just yeah. it just no it just sees them more intricately yeah. um so so at what point the nihilist in me comes out and says at what point are they going to find that we're the problem and we need to all go away <laughs> 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 or or i mean are can they ever take over full control or will we ever let that happen and if so what are those what do you think i mean do you, you, do know, you think I, doom and gloom or do you think boy we that's can all a be friends that's a that's a fun interesting maybe we do that for its own question. its own episode we ha yeah that'd be another good one um we have purpose you know we we have evolved drives. One of those are things like beauty. I mean, another interesting question is why is it, why is it that beauty gives us pleasure? Because pleasure, you know, sex gives you pleasure. Food gives you pleasure. You know, being with your group gives you pleasure. Pleasure is the way that is, is a reward for doing things that have good survival value. Why the heck is it that a piece of art is rewarded by evolution in ways that are similar to how things like sex are rewarded by evolution? There's one. Uh, I think it could bring people together because say, say you're moved by a sunset. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. prior to art, we had, we had just landscape, right? I mean, yeah. obviously it wasn't, it wasn't cities and, and uh, pavement obviously yeah. right so there had maybe that made it 
also communal because you join together to appreciate something together. So it actually engaged or even pushed a little bit of that communal button. Give me, well. give me your personal definition of beauty. Anything that moves color. I mean, anything that catches your eye would be beautiful in some way. What things catch your eye? Sim what are the uh, properties of something that catches your shine eye? On, shiny metal objects. Uh, and that's shiny a great question, objects, right? Yeah. I mean, I was just saying like sun, for example, the sun would be one. I think that a lot of people would look to in very ancient times, right. As, as something that was pretty routine, but awesome. Right. It created the okay. heat and, and all, all right. these things. I, you know, I'm spitballing here, Jeff. I'm, well, I'm let, okay, guy, let, me, so. let me ask you that. <laughs> let me, let me ask you this. Um, suppose that you find yourself just staring at a completely blank, flat, white, surface of a piece of sheetrock. Okay. Okay. Assuming that you are not someone who appreciates the fine intricacies of sheetrock, would that be something that you'd look at and say, oh man, that's just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life? I certainly would. You would not. However, beauty being subjective, someone might, and that might make me pause and ask them what the heck they're looking at and what they see in it. But the someone... So it brings us together. The, the someone, <laughs> the, the, which is why I quali qualified it as saying, you know, if if your world isn't taken with, with making sheetrock or whatever, to, that someone with the right pre-existing concepts might see it. But it's not the kind of thing that you look at and say, hey, that's beautiful. Certainly not. Now no. imagine something that you and I know about and maybe some of your younger listeners are going to say, what in the world are you talking about? Snow on a, a television screen. <laughs> the white static. The yes. white static. Would you call that especially beautiful? It, it, it's cool because it looks alive. It dances. Yeah. But I wouldn't call it beautiful, but yeah. it would catch my eye. Okay. For sure. Yeah. So now that picture that I took of the, the Hubble image of the Eagle Nebula, the, the pillars of creation, if you want to call them that, would you and you know, say what you will, but would you consider that to be something that is somewhere in the realm of what you might call beautiful? And and I know this sounds weird, and I'm not trying to be cheeky, but I would just call that so aw awesome. Okay, it's just beyond it's beyond beauty because it's just a thing that is. Okay. Um, I think beauty would be more like, hand, like hand probably created by humanity in some way, yeah. in general, right? Gonna, and I'm we we have beauty that, in but... people. Well, it's it's not it's not a hundred percent right because obviously things Sunsets in are nature beautiful. are beautiful. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah objectively beautiful okay one of the things that happened when i when i um when i produced when i i released that image and i actually gave a tedx talking about this if people want to go track it down i watched it today oh you very... did okay yeah i'll include that on there yeah that was the one in uh tucson right uh it was in one two Mesa. It was, mesa. was it, mesa? it was mesa mesa that's right yeah. it was tedx mesa that's what it was yes but the 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 difference between those, I think, and this is having, having talked to lots and lots of people like artists about their reaction to it. Yeah, you know, I, I found myself talking to a lot of such people when I was talking about that image because they responded to it strongly. Something, the, the thing that seems to be at the core of things that we call beauty involve pattern in the midst of complexity. That is, if it's just, you know, hey, I've got a completely blank wall here. Okay, there's plenty of pattern, but there's no complexity. There's nothing to draw us in. Right. That that screen of static, man, there's all sorts of complexity, but there's no pattern to be found. Right. On the, yeah, it's very random. It's very random. On the other hand, you know, the, the sunset, the Mona Lisa, the the image of the, the Eagle Nebula, Pillars of Creation, call it what you will. Those things have pattern in the midst of complexity. That is, there is all sorts of complexity there, and but when you look at it, you are drawn into it because of your mind's, the way that your mind constructs a perception of pattern there. 
and that's what we call beautiful. Well, how is it that we got to be who we are? We got to be who we are by being best. You know, one of the ways we got to be who we are is is buying the best people on the being the best people on the block at being able to see patterns in nature and use those patterns in nature to understand and predict things that will happen and to you know behave differently and and so on and so forth so, absolutely so yeah, we are we huge. are pattern recognition engines that's our our brains are are predictive bayesian pattern recognizers <laughs> if you really want to put it all together um so that the perception of beauty is pleasurable because our ability uh, the, the fact that we are drawn to patterns in the midst of complexity the fact that we find pleasure in patterns in the midst of complexity is what draws us to them and and leads us to engage them and it is in the process of engaging them that we learn the things about the world that have allowed us to to have the kind of success that we have had and you know science you know for some people and eh, science man for me science is the most beautiful thing in the world because it is all about pattern in the midst of of complexity you know the, right. all of these things we were talking about are just right gorgeous. i mean so many, don't don't we want to all basically the the idea is to solve the entire universe on one sheet of paper right that's ultimately the goal yeah to make it as simple as possible yeah i'm just saying to make it you know to simplify it and get it yeah. you know to understand yeah. i mean really to understand what's that one equation well and that's an answer <laughs> yeah it's Although at the same time, there's that going on. But the other thing that is going on, again, um, all, all driven by what we can now do with, with computing, is the science of complexity, the science of chaos, the science of emergence, so that we can talk about um, how, how does... How does what we think of as atomic physics emerge from particle physics? How does chemistry emerge from atomic physics? How does biology emerge from chemistry? How does how does the the you know nervous systems ultimately consciousness emerge from that? And so you look at us today. And you can say, yeah. okay, we are emergent, complex, self-aware creatures. Yeah, I mean, I've always talked about consciousness and the emergent property, right? Yeah. Is, yeah. is it an emergent property or is it a thing? It's And it, se it seems to lean towards the emergent property, yeah. like temperature is an emergent property of the yeah. molecules yeah. smashing against each other faster, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, you have to be careful because there are people who talk about weak emergence and there are people who talk about strong emergence. Strong emergence is somehow, yeah, you get sufficiently complex that this whole new entity comes into existence. What we're talking about here is weak emergence. What we're talking about here is, is there's no new physics, there's no new ontological, metaphysical thing that has appeared in the world, but rather a... a a complex system has come to the point that it is exhibiting properties that you would never have imagined that it could exhibit or that it would exhibit or that you would have predicted on the basis of the, the properties one level down in that chain of emergent. Um, you know, a really good example of that, uh, a murmuration of starlings. And anybody who has never seen a murmuration of starlings should go put murmuration of starlings into YouTube and then sit back for a long period of time and watch what groups of starlings do. 
Yeah. You know, they, they just seem to flow together. They just, they flow yeah. and they go through all of these incredible shapes and so on and so forth. And in fact, people like Rupert Sheldrake, ah, finger down the throat there, um, have talked about that as, oh, see, there has to be this, this, you know, other thing out there because clearly a murmuration of starlings could never happen unless they were all involved in this morphic resonance thing and so on and so forth until somebody came along and paid close attention. I believe they take the lead right off their wing, like right off their tip or it, something. It, it's it it's turned, like almost instantaneously. It's a starling. I think the number is seven. A starling pays attention to its seven nearest neighbors. And it, if a neighbor gets that, that at one point they follow those neighbors until a neighbor gets too close. And if the neighbor gets too close, they move away. And then they all follow that. And they're all looking at their nearest neighbors and they're all doing exactly the same thing on the basis right. of what their nearest neighbors do. And yeah, the, they're basically flying in formation, yeah, some real yeah. tight, small mini formation in a bigger group. And then what happens is, okay, here comes your falcon, you know, diving through it. Because the other rule that they have is that, okay, if you, if you see something that looks dangerous, you, you head away. And so something happens that causes a few birds, the first one to see the threat, to start moving differently. And the birds around them respond, and the birds around them respond, and the birds around them respond. And these waves just go out through the group, and you wind up with, with these extraordinarily complex, unpredictable patterns now of the way that birds are flying. And the poor falcon doesn't have a chance. The falcon is surrounded by prey, and yet that prey is now, individual birds are now behaving so erratically, they are behaving chaotically. And the thing about chaos is it's not predictable. For sure. Which means that the falcon depends upon being able to predict that, okay, I'm going to go here. And when I get here, the prey animal will be there. And, and right. I you can't, you can't lead it. it. Right. You yeah. Can't you can't lead it. lead it off or head it off because yeah. it could change direction 90 degrees at, in an instant. Exactly. And so here is this extraordinary complex material. It is absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it is, it is beautiful beyond words. And what it is, is this emergent group behavior that can be boiled down to like three, three, well, four simple rules. Look at your, well, look at your near, your seven nearest neighbors. And it's interesting because it really is kind of seven because they've run, one of the reasons they really know this is how it works is that now you can write computer programs that Im that actually embody these rules and you can see what happens and they've tried six and eight and seven is what and, the ones and, that seem to come yeah. out the most accurate the ones, or the ones, that come the ones the most... there's a there's a peak you look at too many and it fails you look at too few and it fails and somewhere right at. around Sweet the spot. Seven. it's fun they've and, they've... and evolution probably start you know it's like how many is this going to take everybody because it's yeah. very efficient yeah maybe four didn't work at first and they had to they had to up it, right, or it's, whatever. It's the birds that were only looking at four of their neighbors that the falcon caught. Right, it's the birds exactly. that were paying attention to 20 of their neighbors that the falcon caught. <laughs> the birds, turns out that they slow. were the ones, yeah. they, the ones that were looking at the nearest seven were the ones that were least likely to be caught, turn the evolutionary crank. Right, and, and then, they, then they reproduced because they're the only yep, ones left. Yep. And boom, boom. there we are. And so there is so, there is this incredible God. It's just gorgeous, and and it emerges from these very few simple rules that you can model that you can see it. In fact, there was a thing. Um, oh, it's probably been done many times by now, but early on, somebody did kind of a fun thing. I believe in Miami they did a public thing where they took a bunch of drones. And yes. they programmed the drones to implement the algorithm 
that Fal or that that um, uh, starlings use, and then they turned the drones loose, and the drones were doing these patterns of the sort. Oh, that that's cool. We're talking about, but that's very neat. Yeah. So yeah, you look at you look at consciousness. Consciousness is nothing like what we we experience it to be because you know our the 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 reliability of our internal sense of how our minds work is about as reliable as our internal everyday notion of things like causality and what ought to be going on on small scales you know, we, we have no better intuitive grasp of, of what's going on inside of our own heads than we do what's going on in the world. Our understanding of what's, or our, our perception of what's going on in our own heads isn't true, it's adaptive. The notion of self was an adaptive concept. It's not real, it's not right, that's not right, the way the brain sure. is actually working, but it is adaptive. And that's all that matters because it helps us, you know, out on the, out on the savannah, it helped people and groups survive. And, and that's what evolution works with. Yeah. So how, how quickly does something, can something be removed, for example, uh, I understand initially there were an, a few things as a baby you're afraid of heights, loud sounds, and it used to be fire, but now we're actually attracted to fire. Actually, because I think evolutionarily we've kind of harnessed it. No, I don't think we're afraid of heights. Well, like if you see a baby approach a step, it's not afraid, but it's like aware of that. That it depends. That edge. It depends. I know oh, really? our our oldest daughter. Um, walked at a very early age. She was walking at eight months. Wow. And we really had to be careful because she would perfectly happily walk up to a step and walk right off the edge. That's interesting. Because she had yet to learn the concept of well, What about crawling? If she was crawling, do you know she would have stopped or would she keep going forward? I can't tell you. Like, I, can't tell you I, that, I would think but... the perception of a baby on all fours – would be different than standing as well. well if you, and I'm wondering if, if you have that perception even to look for it. At, if at, if at you, that young age. if you look at babies, babies are hardwired to see faces. That seems to be a hardwired yes. thing, but yeah, for sure. you know, they're hardwired to say, Hey, that smells good. I'm going to suck on it. Okay. So there's, there's that one. They are hardwired for very little else. A baby literally cannot perceive a chair. Correct. A baby literally cannot perceive its own hands. A baby can't perceive any of that stuff because it doesn't have the concepts to perceive it. You know, okay, there's there's there are signals coming in, but it doesn't know what to do with those signals. And so the reason, you know, it's been said many times that play is very serious business, and it is, because what the baby is doing is just kind of interacting with things in a random way. But hey, sometimes when I do this, that happens. And so you right. start so to, it learns to connect some things. It learns to connect some things. And then as it learns to connect some things, correlations, learns, I guess, right? I guess make correlations. Yeah, uh, not only correlations, but also when I act in this way, that thing happens which means you start moving in the direction also of uh, building an internal model, model of causal things. Um, oh, I, I, know a, I know a really cool one talking about babies. Uh, do you have kids? I do not. You do not. Okay. No. You ever, you, you, do you like, you've had opportunity to play with babies, I suspect. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'll sit in a sandbox all day yeah. if I could. You look at an infant and you will often hear people, oh, infants learn to make faces by imitating 
the adult because just, you know, an adult talks to a baby and you start making these exaggerated faces and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Well, a baby is learning because they're mimicking the adult. No, they're not. Babies don't know how to mimic adults. You know, they don't have any clear control over their faces. They don't know what their face looks like. How the heck are they supposed to mimic adults? Turns out that careful observation shows that what is actually happening is that the adult is mimicking the baby. The baby <laughs> makes an oh, face and the adult looks at it. Oh, look, at you, you're so cute. And so what the, the baby, oh, when I do oh, this, then my face does what that face up there is doing. And so babies, that's in, that's babies actually learn how to start making meaningful facial expressions by the reaction of the of the subject on which they're using by them. the reaction of the subject <laughs> on which they're using them until finally they they develop enough self identity that they discover themselves in a mirror and then you know they'll stand there love and, the red dot test <laughs> yeah yeah so but again, it's, and again, we're talking here about the, the fun thing about babies learning is that it gives you an opportunity to look at constructed consciousness at its very cleanest, you know, there you go. You're, you're starting with the situation where there are very, very few concepts in place and you watch and you can see those concepts being built, which is why, you know, you will, experts in child development will talk about various phases through which children tend to go. And what you were looking at there is you were looking at children building the concepts that are needed to, to support the next layer of concepts that are needed to to support the next layer of concepts. What's the earliest memory that you have? Oh, that's a great question. It's probably five, maybe okay. five, six years old, maybe. Why don't you have memories from when you were two, when you were three? That's a great question. Um, I have, I'm sure I've got some repressed ones, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I understand the consciousness really starts at about year and a half, two. So that's when this awareness really happens. Is that about right? What's, I mean, yeah, you know, that depends on exactly. It's not a snap. Hey, all of a sudden you've got awareness. Yeah. That, no, that no, for, no, no. It turns out that memories, boy, the science of memory is another really cool thing. That's all tied into this. Memories are, are part and parcel with perceptions. That is, perceptions are built out of our, our concepts, our ideas, our model of the world. Memories are too. Memories are not, they're not a, a, a tape. They're not a roll of film. They're not something like that. What memories right. are, are perceptions that are, are, are constructed from concepts and then the memories are formed in terms of those concepts. And so there's, there's incredible data compression going on. If you want to think about it that way, that, you know, all right, my, my memory of, of the total eclipse, you know, built on all sorts of concepts that I had about, okay, I have concepts about the, the celestial mechanics of it. And I have concepts about the sun and circles, and I've got concepts about the family and I have all of these kinds of concepts. And so I imagine that, Hey, I have a, a clear, clean autobiographical memory of going up to uh, to Idaho and watching a solar eclipse and how cool that was. It turns out that really what I have, my memory, is a memory that that says, okay, this is a thing that involved a mix of all of these concepts. 
that I can then reconstruct into something that feels like an autobiographical memory. Which goes back yeah, to that yeah, earlier conversation. That makes total sense. Which goes back to that earlier conversation about witnesses not being able to, you know, witnesses see the same thing and claim that completely different things happen. Yeah, because it's through their filter. Yeah. So or now they, when they reconstruct it, it then yeah. gets yeah. judged, is what I like to say. But uh-huh. so now imagine what happens is I have I have construct and and okay, first of all, back to back to kids. If you don't have a sufficient set of concepts in place, or if your concepts change too much going downstream, you can't form a memory of that sort, or you at least can't form a memory of that sort that is going to have any meaning when you're farther downstream and have radically different concepts that you're working with. You know, you just, you just can't do it. You know, it it's, you don't, you don't have the concepts available to construct memories that can be decoded later when your concepts have changed so radically. An implication of that, though, if you think about it, is, oh, you mean if I've stored memories in terms of these kinds of concepts, What happens when those concepts change and then I reconstruct the memory? And the answer is you can get radically different memories. That, that something happens, your brain constructs a memory using the, the building blocks that it has to work with, and then downstream those building blocks have their their meanings, their implications, their connections, all of that kind of stuff, have changed. So when you reconstruct the memory, you think that you have this autobiographical memory of what happened that's nothing like what actually happened, but it's just because the meaning of the concepts have changed. So basically a current memory I have from when I was 10 yep. is... M- I've gone through some pretty drastic changes yep. over the last four or five years. Yep. Uh, so in that, in that filter, through that filter, it's different than it was 10, 15 years ago. Yep. And it's, a, and they're both, they're both correct memories just through the perception of my filters they, at the time. They are, they are constructed memories. Every time you have, constructed every, memories. every time you, you, you access a memory, you have to reconstruct it. In the process of reconstructing it, you make it vulnerable. And then to save the memory, you have to reincorporate it. That's another thing that goes on with memory. Every time you you access a memory, that memory changes because it has to be rebuilt. And so that's another thing. I've, I've now got different concepts and I reconstruct a memory. Now when I or, or I, I access a memory, when I reconstruct that memory, that memory is now going to be encoded in terms of my current concepts. So there's that aspect of things as well. Dig into the, I, this is a thing that you would really enjoy. Dig into the science of memory. Yeah. So the question about this then is what, what happens with a repressed memory? Or if you're repressing, you know, uh, an experience that was unpleasant, that they talk about quite often um, quite often what happens with a repressed memory is some really well-intentioned therapist has, has placed another thought in there given you yeah has given you yeah. memories that for you seem as real as any other memories that you have that have absolutely no similarity at all to objective events that actually happened. Is there such a thing as, I guess that blackout? I mean, there's the blackout, yeah. right? We've had, we've had people yeah. seeing red or just going, you know, completely yeah. blacking out. How does that, I mean, are those more physiological effects than in the actual uh, consciousness or this, this creation of the 
illusion or boy the... you need you need to dive into the science on memory. All right. i mean it is it All is right. fascinating stuff but it, it's it is that's why i'm asking yeah, questions but, but the way that, well let me let me give you some examples of yeah of absolutely things. um there is oh god what's her name there are there are two different scientists two women and one actually worked under the other and I can't remember either of their names right now. I feel embarrassed anyway, but who have done a, a tremendous amount of, of really fun research on memory. Um, one of the things that they've done, for example, is figure out that it is really easy to implant false memories. Like there's, a, there's an experiment that has been done that is really remarkably <laughs> repeatable and also kind of troublesome where they have convinced people who have never had any trouble with the law whatsoever that they have had serious trouble with the law. There was, uh, there was a case that I recall where a man can actually wrote a confession that yeah. he molested his daughter yeah. or something. And he, that never, never happened. happened. That never happened. Yeah. And in this, and it's a little bit, disturbing again the the implications of this for law where suddenly an eyewitness account which has forever been the gold standard in law turns out to be highly flawed highly flawed <laughs> let's, let's call it that highly or at least flawed. suspect you right know, get into reading about the the innocence project and such as that where they've gone back and used uh dna tests to show that people could not have committed various crimes especially you know, sexual assaults and things like that. And, um, you know, yeah, it's a, very interesting a bunch, because I, a bunch I was... of those have turned out to be not true. And a disproportionate yeah. number of those have been turned out to be not true in ways that reflect implicit bias. Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting because I, I grew up in a, probably a little bit more of a vacuum in, in certain things. And I was pro death penalty. Yeah. And then when I, when I, when I stepped back in my, as I got older, I looked at those numbers and I'm like, if any percentage or of any way I could, I just couldn't, it's not worth, it's not worth that one person losing their life for the sake of all the other ones yeah. for, you know, vengeance or whatever. It just didn't make sense to me. And it just, it was, I had to look at that very objectively. And if you, if you pardon the reference, you know, there, but for the grace of God, um, there are there are other, and these are programs that exist in some prisons, and I have not done one, but I would like to. You take a group of people, and this group of people is half people that are just coming from the outside world with whatever notions they have, you know, just a group of people come in. And then you've got a group of inmates. And you, you put them all on one side of the room, and you start asking questions like... Um, could you hear gunfire often from the the place where you grew up? Um, you know, could you? And I'm I'm forgetting examples, but just down this line of questions right, about but like environment, you, any your, environmental changes yeah. or any kind of things that were going yeah. on in your life. Yeah, yeah. were it your yeah. were your parents married um did you know anyone who was a victim of violent crime when you were young uh were you exposed to to drug use when you were young um alcoholism was a big one mm -hmm. uh there was a lot of those yeah and i did just, a lot of i did one on eugenics yeah, as yeah. well and i remember those those questionnaires and every time you ask a question you say if the answer is yes take a step forward if the answer is no, stay where you are. And you go through this and a dozen, and the, it's key that they're all things that clearly the individual had no control over. It wasn't like, did you decide to join a gang? Right. You know, Absolutely. These, these were, these, these are factors <clears throat> that you experienced, yeah, but, it, but it yeah. might be where there, you know, were there gangs in the neighborhood where you grew up. The bottom line though, is that over a series of maybe a dozen of these questions, you wind up with all of the inmates on one side of the room and all of the people who weren't inmates on the other side of the room. And it's like, Crazy. oh, you mean had, had 
that individual who's in here, and I came in thinking that, oh, anybody who did that must be terrible and horrible character and awful person and so on and so forth. Um, you mean if that person had grown up in a, a home with a functioning nuclear family with sufficient financial resources, uh, a school to go to that was was high quality. More than one, more than one perceived option of way more out. More than one person, and so on and so forth. That that yeah. that person would be would be working in the next office over. Is it? Yeah, that's what that means. It it is interesting because it's one of those things. Uh, I did one on eugenics, and that, those were some of those questionnaires. They were trying to sterilize. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they, there was a there was a movement that they wanted to sterilize up to 15 million people yeah. or 15 million Americans when there were 97 million in the country. Yeah, that was in 1910. Yeah. And it was for all these types of things. But the environment created that. And it's as I mean, Sam Harris did a wrote a book called Free Will. Mm -hmm. Right. It's kind of the seven second thing you talk mm -hmm. about. Saddam Hussein's son who will drive to a wedding and rape the, the bride right there on the altar. Right. He grew up as Saddam Hussein's son. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, 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 it's not that one hundred percent. However, yeah, that's that's the environment, that's the vacuum and the filter that this person has yeah. is through Saddam Hussein. Yeah, which is why, which is why you know, let's let's broaden it, and I'm going to go ahead and get a little political. Yeah, sure. you, you, I, I, we can talk politics. I, you know, you know I, I don't. You know, I, I, I like it in the philosophical sense, so we can do it in that way. I don't go people, you know, individuals and all that stuff, but let's do it. Well, I don't I don't want to go too far down that path. I was I was just <laughs> no, going to no, say no, that it. it is often and yeah, I do the same thing. It's hard not to. You you look at folk typically on the right side of the. Well, OK, January 6th whole bunch of people decide that that in the name of the constitution what they need to do is go and attempt a coup uh, you know a, a violent insurrection breaking into the nation's capital and wait wait you mean you mean not peaceably assemble as our rights are written to us in the constitution right exactly <laughs> so, see like that's interfere. the funny yeah. thing to me yeah. that cracks me up but it, yes please it does it does me too and you look at that and you think how in the world can anybody with functioning gray and white matter between their ears not understand that for what it was and the answer is those people honestly, many of them at least, honestly believed, believe that they were doing the right thing. Oh, yes, absolutely. Because their perception of, of the world, their, their conscious reality is a conscious reality that is built out of the concepts that they have to work with. And people have spent tremendous effort. You know, some of that they grew up with it. But people have also spent tremendous effort in developing those concepts in people. You know, a, a problem, the, the, oh, I don't want to get too terribly, too terribly political. I will say, that while folk toward the left side of the political spectrum are are making up phrases like save the planet and talking about how important it is to take the the you know moral high road that people on the right side of the political spectrum are going off to Madison Avenue and saying okay how is it that you convince people that they really ought to be smoking and <laughs> You know, it's it's that it's that second approach <laughs> that that tends to be more effective. Um, one of the one of my frustrations with folk who are on the reality matters side of all this stuff is they really need to come to understand that a good battle is one that you win. You a Tom Lear fan by any chance? Tom Lear, I refresh my memory. I wouldn't 
No, Tom, possibly. Tom Lear. Uh, I feel ignorant now, Jeff. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Go track down some Tom Lear. Tom, <laughs> Tom Lear is a, uh, was a, I mean, he, no, he's still around, but I'm still going to use past tense, was a comic in the 1950s and 1960s. He was a Harvard trained mathematician who started writing and performing stuff just for you know, groups of colleagues, and it took off. And for a while, that's the kind of stuff that he he did. He sang things like Poisoning Pigeons in the Park, if you've ever heard that. he. Oh, yes, you know. yes. Actually, no, you shared him with uh, when, when we had that uh, meetup. Oh, okay. You shared some okay. of his YouTube yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yes, yes. I remember. <laughs> yes, I remember exactly what you're talking about. That's why it, it rung a bell, yeah. and I, I just yeah. didn't. Yes, no, exactly but it's mean. just it's just absolutely great stuff. I mean, anybody in the in the fifties who writes something called the Masochism Tango, you know, they have to be you know just fun people. But he have, went. Yeah, he he eventually stopped performing. One of the one of the reasons he stopped performing is he said, "Well, when they gave Henry Kissinger the Nobel Peace Prize, political satire died." <laughs> um, but then he went, uh, he was faculty at the University of California, Santa Cruz for a long time, where he taught, among other things, musical theater and some math and stuff like that, and apparently didn't really like to tell his students about who he was because he didn't want that to become a, a big thing in the classroom. But anyway, he he wrote uh, a song, performed a song called Folk Song Army, which is really hilarious. But the lyric that always comes to mind when I talk about stuff like this is, I remember the war against Franco. It's the kind where all of us belonged. He won all of the battles, but we had all the good songs. Um, there's, <laughs> there is a lesson there. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding, right? <clears throat> but anyway, um, so yeah, that's that's. So where I'm gonna I'm gonna interject here. By the way, you mentioned a while back you were you working with the uh, NLP therapist. Oh yeah, that's actually kind of the direction that my career has taken me in the meantime. Excellent. I was I was um, yeah tenured faculty at ASU. Boy, several things happened. Part of it was after after being front and center for all of the extraordinary Hubble stuff, the idea of just kind of settling into my chair and and you know being a gray beard writing my grant proposals and so on and so forth didn't hold a lot of appeal. Another thing though is that a colleague down the hall one day came into my office. And to let me know that another colleague of ours um, had passed away. And he was, you know, 83 or something like that. And he was sitting at the same chair at the same desk in the same office where he had probably worked every day for 40 years. And I think, I'm not certain of this, but I have the impression that he literally had a heart attack and face planted on his keyboard. That's awful. And my, that was my reaction, too. I said, that's awful. And my colleague said, why is that awful? I said, because, yeah, to just sit there at that same desk for that long and just die one day? Come on, there are other things in life. And my colleague came back and said he had a paycheck and health insurance. You know, what was he missing? Was it something that he loved? Because, like, Harry Callis died in the Phillies broadcast booth. Yeah. Well, well, you know, yeah. you know what I mean? It was kind of like mean. a, it was different, but I get what you're saying. Like being kind of a slave to the system, right? Yeah. To the paycheck and the, and the, and that. And darn it. Ex life is about experience. Life is it about, is. Yeah. and I kind of realized that, you know what? I'm doing this thing and it's not fun in the way that it used to be. 
And it's not fun and the way it used to be, in part because higher education is not what it used to be. And I'm not going to get into that right now. Other than to say, we're I we're going to have some conversations after you know offline. Right, so right. we'll talk about some other subjects we could talk okay, about later. All right, for sure. But anyway, um, you know, I I kind of came to realize that you know. I am headed down this path where if I'm not careful, when I'm 85 years old, I'm going to face plant on my damn keyboard. And there are a lot of things that I would want to do. And in particular, I have had a lot of very, very interesting and unusual experiences including everything from the range of things that I had been exposed to, to, to being at the middle of things like Hubble, to, um, you know, the interactions with a, a broader world that we've talked about, to, to teaching, writing a textbook, having kids, travel, so on and so forth. Anyway, down along Absolutely, ways. yeah. Myriad, unlike myriad unlike an awful lot of scientists, I am very much a people person. Um, and I kind of came to the realization that, you know, I, I have things to do other things with. I have things that I could offer in context other than writing the next astrophysical journal paper or teaching the next class. And so I took early retirement. And kind of said, all right, I'm going to figure out what to do with that. And among the places I landed is these days I am uh, a coach. You know, I coach professionals, executives. I coach a lot of technical people, which probably isn't a surprise um, because, you know. You well, it works because you can relate. I can relate. And once you can relate, that's how you can really get breakthroughs. I can, sure. I can speak, I can speak the language. Speak geek, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, these are people that not, not to take anything away from, from other people who are in that kind of profession, but these are people that by virtue of kind of what they do, um, they, they could easily run an awful lot of people who, who coach and things like that in circles. They're also people who tend to be pretty skeptical. There's a there's a certainly a mindset in that world that, oh, you shouldn't need such things because somehow I should be able to do everything myself. I'm a little hard to run circles around. And the other thing though is all this stuff that we've been talking about in terms of okay, constructed perception, constructed conscious experience. We didn't talk about it, but constructed emotion. You know, people think, oh, this thing happened to me. To me, to right? Me. No, it didn't. There were right. events that took place, but your emotional reaction to that, your perception of that is a construction. It just is. And you have to be careful because it kind of reminds me of like a text because a text is just black and white yeah. letters or on a screen yeah. Yeah. and you read into an email, you read into a text, you put, so you put your, you project your emotional yeah. state on the, exactly. on the email that you're reading through that filter. Exactly. And now you're offended yeah. for a simple, you know, greeting or whatever, right. any kind yeah. of statement. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, Oh boy. It's probably a good thing that I did not remain in the classroom when the idea of safe places and trigger warnings and such things started to become a big deal. Because the only trigger warning I would ever give is one that says, I am going to find ideas that you consider to be uncomfortable. I'm going to find preconceptions that you have. I'm going to find those kinds of triggers and I'm going to press them as hard as I can press them because that's my job. Be that's how you grow. Because that is how you grow. That is how you learn. That is how you develop new concepts. That is how you change the way that you perceive and experience the world. And this notion of, of 
safe places and trigger warnings for people that, oh, I, you know, um, uh, My, no microaggressions, micro, I, I, micro, microaggressions. I will not go out of my way to insult someone. I will, if I am aware that someone is sensitive to something, I will do, I will do everything I can to be sensitive to that. But the idea that somebody says something and immediately you start looking for reasons to take offense. Okay. Where's the microaggression? Where's the, Oh, and then, and this person is a member of, of such and such a class. And therefore that means that, that they must have these motivations and these ideas and these so on and so forth. And based on those categories, that means that if they say hello, really they're being condescending. You know that. Uh, I well, I, it's kind I, of I funny too there. because because it, it, you know it's kind of like that. It's like I'm. A, I'll be honest. I'm a libertarian constitutionalist. You know, okay. I love the freedom of speech. Yeah. With that freedom of speech, though, there is a responsibility. There is a personal accountability uh -huh. with it. Yeah. So generally your job is to not go out of your way to offend absolutely yeah. the other person though that the the right to be offended is not a protected right, right in the constitution right. and the truth is i you know i i watch a lot of different people mm -hmm. but jordan peterson comes to mind when i think of this and i go offense is where we actually start the conversation to to come to a better place someone takes offense to something i say well maybe i can grow maybe we can both learn from each other to find that common ground to move forward, mm -hmm. you know, well, and you can't, you can't learn unless you're offended, you know, or, or it, it doesn't hit, you know, it doesn't stick. If it is, if it is comfortable, if it doesn't, growth is uncomfortable. Growth means Absolutely. that you are, you are, you are challenging existing concepts. Growth means you are experiencing, um, cognitive dissonance. Another problem is that, okay, you have an experience in your past and it didn't seem like a big thing in the past. It was no big deal. You know, okay, somebody walked up behind you and put their hand on your shoulder, right? Whatever. Yeah, it was just no big deal. Right. In, in terms of the concepts with which you encoded those memories in terms of behaviors that were, were you know, in the... But then you change a bunch of those concepts and you come back years after the fact and recall it. And all of a sudden you're being traumatized by something that happened 20 years ago that was not traumatizing when it happened. Now, that is not something happening to you. That is you right. generating those emotions. There is a you change that you change you know, that filter. There is a there is a, a very interesting book um, uh, uh, by the name of How Emotions Are Made uh, by what's her name Lisa Feldman Barrett. Am I getting her first name right? Anyway, that it, that's worth reading. That it's all about. Okay, we emotions are constructed just like everything else. And so the emotional reactions that we feel are not the world doing that to us. They are the emotional reactions that we generate. And we generate them based upon the, the concepts, the worldview, the, all of that that we have. And so wearing, I mean, wearing my coaching hat you know, with I, sometimes the best coaching is when you ask the question that might get you fired. Um, you know, it's like, okay, are, are your emotions serving you or are you serving your emotions? You know, what, what are the benefits that you are getting from emoting about those things in that way? Because right. I, there's no way you can just say, oh, I'm going to now emote differently. That's not the way it works. Because just like everything else, you emote preconsciously, you know, long before you have even begun to understand that there was a conscious event for you to respond to. 
your emotions are underway. You know, your amygdala responds to, to perception of threat or, or to information that it considers threatening in yes, absolutely. a few milliseconds. I mean, much, much, much faster than any conscious reaction. Um, which gets into implicit bias, implicit bias. Hey, you notice you're like in the middle, you're in the middle of your movement before you even realize what you're jumping for, away from. Yeah, or... exactly. That is a, <laughs> you're like, what the fuck? That know, is a, in that way. That is a wonderful example. You know, you're sitting there doing the dishes and then all of a sudden you're bent over and you have a glass in your hand three inches above the floor. And only after the fact... If it, only after the fact do you realize what has happened. Um, although yeah, we, are, we are very good, the way our brains work is they are very good at making our perceptions seem as though our perception is coincident with, with events in the world, even though they're out of sync by, I say, something like a third of a second, typically. Yes, yeah, I think is it anything audibly? Is it about tenth of a? Is it ten milliseconds or less? And you're and it's not out of sync, but anything beyond that. So it's all depending on the sensory. You well, know, and sense that's itself. but it's think about that though. Okay, it takes it takes less time to to process auditory signals than it does to process visual signals. It takes less time to process visual signals than it does tactile signals. You know, it, it, it takes less time for all of those signals to arrive than it does for us to then construct a conscious awareness of this. And yet, I hold up my fingers. There, I just snap my fingers. Right. There, were, there was audio signal, visual signal, tactile signal, um, you know, all of this stuff going on all of which had different timescales associated with it. And yet what I perceived was one coincident event. I just snapped my fingers because that perception is not about data arriving. That perception is about my brain, my brain constructing the perception of the finger snap. It's like, okay, you know, if you were the one to snap your fingers, then I'm looking at you and, and my predictions are that you're just going to sit there and suddenly I start getting error signals because you have lifted your hand. And because I am getting error signals, that's where my attention turns to. We attend to things that are changing because the things that are changing are the things that are not in line with what our predictions about the world were, which means that the things that were changing are the things that we probably need to attend to if we're going to keep the leopard from taking us down. So people, whether they want to or not, attend. Okay, I'm now attending. And so I'm, I'm predicting. All right. Right. When you finally snap your fingers, I have a concept of finger snaps. All right, so I understand what finger snaps are. Well enough for my brain to predict. Okay, there should be there there should be action potentials coming in along these nerves. And then a little while later, there should be action potentials coming in along those nerves. And a little while later, I expect some action potentials coming in along here and so on and so forth. And I make those predictions. And by the way, you know, wonderful. All of those predictions spread out over, you know, hundreds of milliseconds turned out to be correct. And therefore, my, my constructed experience is there was a single synchronous snap of the fingers and the light and the sound and, and, and the, you know, all of that arrived at exactly the same time because it was a synchronous event. Yeah. It is. It is so interesting how the brain puts that all together for you. Yeah, it yeah. is. But again, it's, it is, that perception in this case that there is a single snap 
is something that is adaptive because okay the 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 lion you know roars and starts to pounce and all of that kind of stuff if my brains <laughs> if if my brain doesn't have those concepts if my brain doesn't need to to put together the fact that that roar and and that leap are are connected somehow right then you know, the likelihood I'm going to survive that experience is not so great. Exactly. So our, our brains construct adaptive perceived realities. We hallucinate our conscious experience, except those hallucin hallucinations are constrained by incoming sensory data. And, but again, back to the, back to the coaching thing, what's kind of fun and what I, what I really enjoy you know, I was talking about emotions a little bit. Um, I'll say to somebody, there's no way that you can just choose to change the way that you perceive the world. You can't do that. But what you can do, what role does consciousness have in all of this? You know, where, where does the conscious mind come in? If all this time really we're just sort of executing habit loops and running with it. Well, what you do have some control over is what concepts you choose to develop. You, you have control over what ideas you're going to delve into. You have the ability to go back and look at your own reactions and say, okay, how, how did that work out? What could I have done differently? What were the factors that came to play? How would I have chosen to emote in those circumstances? What resources right. could I have called upon? You know, all of those kinds of questions are things that you can choose to do. And in the process, of, and another thing that you can choose to do is you can say, okay, thinking forward, when such and such a situation comes up, how do I want to respond to it? How do I emote about it in real time? How do I plan for it? How do I practice it? So that, again, what I am doing is I am developing the concepts, developing the experiences, developing the habits such that the, the output of that is that when something happens, I don't have to think about emoting differently. I just emote differently. You know, right. it's, it's, yeah, absolutely. it's just in a, in a sense, and people who understand what I'm talking about will go, of course, and others will say, what the heck is he talking about? In a, in a sense, it is, it is systems engineering. That is, you look at it and say, okay, how is the system behaving? How would I like the system be, to behave? What are the things about the system that I can change? Right. When I change those things, how does it change the, the, the output? How does that change in output correspond to what it was that I was trying to accomplish? And by by taking that kind of an approach to coaching you know starting out with okay what are the things that what are the things that you care about what are the values that you have what are the things that you want to accomplish um, how do those things fit together you know okay and and what are the behaviors and how do those behaviors align and why do those behaviors not align? And you are facing this challenge. What are the things about this challenge that you are not seeing? You know, okay, how in this challenge do you find opportunities? How, how do you change the way that you emote? Because another thing that goes on is that once you're amygdala, once, once, once the part of your brain that is the arousal part of your brain at the, the center of fight, flight, freeze is activated. 
it shuts down the the prefrontal cortex. It shuts down the thinking and value based decision making parts of your brain. Again, for good reason. When you know, when the when the leopard jumps out of the bushes, that's the wrong time for you to stand there and say, "Oh, isn't that wonderful? That's a pretty cat. I should really do my part to help preserve." the species. No, the <laughs> leopard jumps out of the bushes at you and your amygdala kicks in and says, you know, forget all of that stuff. Run, you idiot. Get out of here. Yeah. And so once, once you are, once you have that part of your brain aroused, then the thinking part of your brain is physiologically incapable of functioning. You know, it's like once you get into an argument with somebody and they feel threatened, then, you know, you can yeah. argue until you're blue in the face. Nothing's going to happen, especially if you feel threatened as well. Exactly. Be yeah. Because you've got, you know, you're, 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 it's not, it's wrong to call it the lizard brain, but I'll call it that for a minute. You know, your lizard. Uh, what's wrong with the lizard brain? Your lizard, because it's not really the, the idea. Is it of offensive trying, to lizards? No. <laughs> no, the idea of the trying brain is one that has oh, okay. kind of, there are problems with that notion. Um, boy, fun stuff there too. It turns out that the cerebellum is high, has more neurons than, than the rest of your brain put together and is highly connected into regions like the, the, um, the, the, prefrontal cortex and the hypothalamus. And it, it turns out that being able to physically move is an important part of forming and, and retrieving. Okay. We could go down that path, but the, the, <laughs> the point here is the, the point here is that once you engage the amygdala, once you've got that part of your brain engaged, you can no longer think the conversation's over. As, as far as anybody moving. On the other hand, yeah, it, turn, it turns out that if you've got the thinking part of your brain engaged, that has the effect of suppressing the fight or flight part of your brain. Right, and it because you tend to not act yeah, then. Yeah, that but, I mean, again, we're talking... We're, we're talking neuroscience here. We're talking about what's going on with, you know, these neurons are firing in ways that inhibit those neurons. Well, yeah, that's part of it. And then, yeah. I mean, you've got efficiency of a system. How much energy yeah. can you really, yeah. uh, you know, can you contribute to all systems? You can't. You have a limited yeah. amount that you can contribute yeah, exactly. to. exactly. And so you're, you're, you are in this circumstance where, okay, you take all of that now. And you say, well, well, what can I do? There's a the, some some neuroscientists talk about the 90 second rule that it takes of order a minute and a half for your amygdala to, to begin to back off if it's really activated, go a bit longer. Um, and so you put all of that together and it's like, OK, I've got somebody here who has who has escalated somebody who is in a, in a place in their brain where it is impossible for them to actually think in a way that lets them make progress. So what do I do? Well, first thing I have to do is I have to give their amygdala a break. So that's a really good time to, to change the subject to something that is, and, you know, there are skills for doing this. You interview people. You, you, that's a skill that you have. To something that is not emotionally threatening. Oh, by the way, you know, you were telling me about that neat thing you were doing, you know, another scuba diver. Oh, yeah, really cool. We're going to Cozumel in October, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. We are going to Cozumel in October. We got caught on Cozumel during Hurricane Wilma a bunch of years ago. That's a fun story. Oh, my gosh. Um, but anyway, it, okay, so you do that. And so now what you have done, you've done, first of all, you've, you've removed the emotional threat. You're giving their amygdala time to de-escalate. 
and you are engaging the thinking part of their brain um, around something that is not emotionally challenging, which means that you're now getting their brain operating in a way that will suppress the, the emotional agitation. And you stay there for a while, and then you can start coming back around in ways where you're you're now more aware of where um, where the 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 I will use the term trigger here where the triggers might be, and right. you find yourself back talking about the original issue, but now talking about the original issue productively because you are you're talking to the thinking brain rather than the reacting brain and maybe what you're talking about at that point is you're talking about okay this is here here is how you are constructing your perception of such and such a thing and you know what are the what are the ways that you could potentially construct that differently and how do you go about you know how might you go about doing that and how might you want to handle a situation like that in the future and you know what resources might be there that you're not seeing maybe go into thinking partner mode for a little bit where we're just you know, kicking around ideas and I get to say, well, gee, I was doing this thing once upon a time. And, you know, here's a, here is an approach that you might want to take or people who talk about this seriously, you know, here are the conclusions that they come to and you're back into a good coaching mode. But a, a, a fun thing about it is that for for whatever reason, I am absolutely fascinated with the neuroscience of all of this stuff. And as I have built those concepts, my perception, my conscious experience of those kinds of conversations with coaching clients have changed. And they've changed in ways that have had a profound impact on how I approach coaching. And just to get even more meta about it, um, you know, with the kind of folk that I tend to coach, folk that are, are very often people with technical backgrounds and, you know, people who find neat ideas interesting. Um, and bore easily with mundane. And, and bore easily with and... mundane and so on and so forth, right. yeah. is you get them then, um, among the concepts that you work on developing, are these concepts about, about constructed perceptions and, and constructed conscious realities and constructed emotions and the, the ways that those can be looked at and understood and how you go about, how you go about laying the groundwork so that you will get into a realm where you are you are behaving in ways that are more consistent than what your goals are that you are uh, emoting in ways such that your emotions are serving you rather than the other way around and you have to emote there've been experiences that they've done there there are conditions where people are unable to emote and a really amazing thing happens. If you can't emote, you can't make decisions. Take someone who is hungry and who is unable to emote and take them to a grocery store and put them in front of, of shelves full of food. And they can't, they don't eat because they can't decide what it is that they want to reach and take off the shelf and throw in the cart. Because without emotions, they have no way to actually, you know, make decisions among those things. It's not a, the, the emotion becomes a driving factor or the catalyst for the action. Yeah, that, that the emotion is an inextricable part of the way that, that we decide because the emotions let you say, okay, this thing is in some sense better, more appealing, more whatever. You know, if I am really just absolutely famished, chances are I'm going to grab that thing that 
that, you know, has loads of calories and lots of sugar and so on and so forth. You, you know, it, it, what we grab to eat depends upon where we are emotionally. I, you have had the experience, I'm sure, of being just completely wasted and coming in and opening the refrigerator and it's full of food and you stand there with the refrigerator door open and you stare at it. Yes. Okay. I've absolutely been yeah, there. You've absolutely been there. What's going on is your brain's, the, you know, <laughs> your, your emotional circuitry just didn't work. In. You, you, right. you are not able to decide of the 47 things in here that I could reach in and grab them and put them in my mouth and would make me feel better. I do not have the emotional capacity to make a decision among those things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, um, the idea of there being a separation between emotion and reason and logic is a very, very damaging pile of horse manure. <laughs> no such, no such separation exists. They are, they are both part and parcel um, of the way that we interact with the world, of the way that we construct the world, of the way that we experience the world, of the way that we do everything. Um, but again, it's, it is a question of, of understanding how is it that the conscious self can step in and become a part of that process in a way that, that those decisions are changing outcomes in ways that, that help me be a better version of myself. You know, coaching, coaching right. isn't therapy. Coaching isn't fixing things. It's not like, you know, okay, I, I don't go off and find somebody who has a, you know, schizophrenia or something and say, Oh, come in. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to do therapy with you. The, the, people that I coach tend to be people who are doing really pretty well in their lives, but they want to up their game. They want to, right. you know, well, there's an edge there or they want to hone something yeah, or, they, you know, always looking for some advantage in yeah, some way. They want to, they want to hone something. They have a, you know, a big decision coming up, maybe a career decision, maybe financial decisions, maybe personal, de you know, whatever. But but they're interested in becoming a a better version of themselves, and the process, the way that I approach it, is all about saying, okay, to do that, um, what what we're gonna do is is we're gonna look at that system, and we're gonna understand how that system is behaving, and we're gonna we're going to find the places where we can where we can make intentional changes in that system in ways that then result in behaviors and result in emotions and and result in perceptions you know result in experiences of the world that are now more in line with what it is that you that that you want to accomplish Along the way, we also might discover that the things that you thought that you wanted to accomplish and the things that you really want to accomplish are very different things. Um, <laughs> that's that's not an uncommon realization. It's funny how that either. works. It's funny how that works. Amazing <laughs> what metacognition does. Yes, it's so crazy. Yeah. So anyway, it's You're not in line with uh, not aligned with your purpose. Yeah, I'm not aligned with your purpose. And then again, you come back to things like the uh, you know the Hubble experience. How is it that you went that that Hubble managed to be the disaster it was when it first flew? You know that was a story that I got to see up close and personal. It turned out that I mean I think it was even more astonishing. Like to your point, it was a success that it got that funding to do this to begin yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. So it started off actually just an amazing collaboration yes. or amazing process. Yeah. yeah. And there are, there are interesting stories there as well, too. If you look at, you know what a KH-12 is? KH-11, KH-12? 
KH11? I'm not familiar. No. Spy satellite that's got a, a, a two and a half inch primary mirror and has a Cassegrain design. And if this is starting to sound a whole heck of a lot like Hubble, it's because it is. And <laughs> yeah, okay, I see it. Yeah. I'm looking at it right okay. now. Yeah. You know, it looks a yeah. heck of a lot like Hubble. It and does. Yes, it look, and it was built by the same people. <laughs> <laughs> and when Hubble was actually in the vacuum chamber in uh, 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 Silicon Valley area, when it was up at Lockheed in, I forget the name of it, when, uh, my brain's going. Anyway. Skunk Works? Any, what, no, this wasn't, this wasn't, oh. God, the Skunk oh, Works yeah. are cool. That'd be another fun conversation. Yeah, um, probably would. I've, yeah. I have some buddies that were engineers. I God, think, the well, so. Kelly Johnson's 14 points for people who don't know what we're talking about with the skunk works. Um, oh yeah. The, the SR 71 blackboard blackbird is one of the coolest pieces of technology ever. That is a beautiful machine. Oh right man. There. That's a beautiful machine. Anyway, oh, <laughs> God, where was I going with this? Anyway, you, uh, you walk in, um, you looked at the facility and right. there, there were two very tall vacuum chambers and you walked down a hall. And if you turned right down at the end of that was the vacuum chamber where Hubble was in thermal vacuum at the time. And if you turned left, you didn't go anywhere because the people there were carrying big guns. <laughs> and it's a, a funny story to the people so it sounds like the nintendo facility up in seattle <laughs> probably and it, it's kind of funny because two of the people on the um on the the first wide field planetary camera team just among the most brilliant people uh, I have ever met both actually won macarthur foundation genius grants we're we're talking about that level of brilliant, you know, one guy by the name of Jim Gunn and the other Jim Westfall, who's the principal investigator on the life pick, who was his only college degree was a bachelor's in geophysics from the University of Tulsa. And here he was a full professor at Caltech and the principal investigator on the most important astronomical instrument and, you know, one of the most important astronomical instruments in history. And well, certainly of its time. Yeah. I mean, and if you ask yourself, how in the world does that happen? You get a sense for just, just how remarkable and brilliant this guy was. So they had gone to a meeting in, uh, um, uh, was it Sunnyvale? Anyway, they had gone. They had gone to an early space telescope meeting um, at at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And at that meeting, there were some things that they had raised questions about, and they said, "But you know, what about we? You know, we have some concerns about that." And somehow, these people on the other side said. Um, don't worry about it. It works. And they say, but just, no, don't worry about it. It works. <laughs> <laughs> so here they are in the airport and they got to talking about, okay, what could you do if you took Hubble and you properly adjusted the focus and you then pointed it at the ground? And they just started, I mean, this is a, you know, this couple of people just waiting for their planes, you know, shooting the breeze, just, just having a conversation. It wasn't a conversation over beer because Huntsville was dry at the time, but um, having a, an interesting conversation and scribbling on napkins. And it was like, okay, you know, well, here's the, here's what the resolution would be on the surface. And here is what the speed would be. And if you were at this speed, you would have to be clocking out the, the, the CCD at this rate so that a given object would move across the, 
the detector at the right rate. And to get the signal to noise that you wanted, you would need to have a detector that was, was so many um, rows long as you clocked it. And you would be producing information uh, that you'd, you'd have this size good field of view and assuming that you, you wanted it all and you'd probably need it in several bands, so a few bands. And so let's calculate what the the data rate of that would be. And so, okay, you would need this kind of a data rate going down. And what that means is you, and so on and so forth. So basically right, what exactly. they were doing is they were just, you know, having fun doing the physics of figuring out, okay, what would you do if you built one of these things and pointed it down? Right. Some weeks later, um, Jim was up at the the Jim Westfall. They're both Jims. Jim Westfall. Yeah, that name sounds very familiar to me. Uh, what was he on a recent project or no, anything? Jim that died. I might, Jim I might died heard? some years ago. Uh, okay, so he, he might have been on some old project that I. Yeah. The name just sounds very now, familiar. Now Westfall could very well be in that. I mean, I know I know Jim's son very well, who is also a physicist, who's um, at Berkeley. So it's it's conceivable that in fact he and I both did our undergraduate years at Rice. Um, but anyway, so Jim goes, Jim visits the Lockheed facility, um, you know, where the, the telescope was at the time. And one of the big mucky mucks in the company came and introduced himself and, you know, was very cordial and asked Jim if he would like to come up to the executive dining room to eat with him and so on and so forth, uh, which is a big deal because they don't usually just take people who were there visiting and take them up to the executive dining room. And so, and the thing is about the executive dining room is the executive dining room is a place where classified conversations take place. Yeah, I would think very, very, very. And so they're they're up here having a conversation. You have to sign an NLP, like or, I'm <laughs> sorry, like a non disclosure every day. I don't know, but in the midst of <laughs> NDA, I in guess. In the midst of this conversation, this guy says to Jim, "And by the way, you are too damn smart for your own good. Watch what you are talking about when you are sitting around in restaurants." At airports, okay? I guess somebody had overheard this conversation where they were just doing the physics and, you know. Yeah, napkin physics, napkin, right? Yeah, like, literally back of just... the napkin physics. And thought that it was a security leak. They thought that here were a couple of people who were talking about the design of the KH-11. <laughs> and that, that, you know, it was just sitting around talking about that kind of stuff in public. And I guess that that they had some people really kind of concerned trying to figure out where this is coming from, who didn't understand that I'm sorry, but you cannot classify physics. <laughs> you know, physics is physics. Yeah. And, and Jim loved to talk about how the time that he got the spies upset. But anyway. It cracks me up because, like, I, you know, when you when you hear those stories, a lot of times science science doesn't think about whether they should or shouldn't do something or the actual application of a tool, right. but whether they can make it. So here you are with Hubble. Yeah. The goal is to take pictures of things that no one's ever seen before. Right. In, to expand our knowledge and we want to turn it and someone decides to take that same technology, turn it inward to watch ourselves. Oh no. Someone had all, yeah. <laughs> someone had already taken that technology and they were watching I'm Earth sure. and they, they I'm were sure. using that experience to guide the development of Hubble is what was going oh, on. There it is. It, went, it was reverse engineered the it other was, way. It there was, you go. it yeah. was engineered very much the other way. There were, so, there were, it's crazy there were though, like half, how we do that, right? Yeah. There were there were two and a half meter down lookers before there were two and a half meter up lookers. Well, Jeff, welcome to the time warp, my friend. It has been three and oh, a half Lord, hours. Has it been? Good heavens, it has if been. If you can believe you know. it. Yeah, I just looked. Just looked. Um, 
we have many a conversation, I think, in our near in our future. So uh, I would like to thank you personally for for coming, joining us. Please tell us, you know, some final words before we call this episode a day. And, you know, before we invite you back on to talk about other stuff. Oh, man. So how can I use a few words and completely spoil the whole thing? Let me give that a thought for a second. <laughs> Webs, no. Give us your website, all your yeah. social media, yeah. all the great yeah. stuff, all the No, I, it's, um, you can, you can find me at jeff-hester.com on a completely practical level. I, I take coaching clients. I do speaking. I do, um, you know, some of the work that I do is, is thought partner work. I'm, I'm really pretty good at being the guy in the room who's talking through a bunch of stuff and comes up with the, the idea that nobody else has thought about just by virtue of, of, a, a fairly broad background and set of perspectives that can be interesting. And so, you know, if, if, if coaching, speaking about both Hubble and what success looks like in the nature of knowledge or working as a thinking partner sounds like something that might benefit you or your organization, you can find me at jeff-hester.com. And I hope that you will because I, I am thoroughly enjoying what I'm doing and I always enjoy a new a new something to wrap my head around. If I don't have something new to wrap my head around every so often, it starts to get boring. And boring is a horrible thing. Yeah, boring is never fun. Yeah, so. Never fun. Well, thank you for firing the synapses because we talked about pretty much we ran the gamut from everything. Yeah. So I'll have to listen to it just so I can make some decent liner okay. notes so people know what we're talking about. Well, take um, take it but... and take it and split it into two, and then next weekend take a break. <laughs> We we were talking about that because I'm looking at it. I, you know, I'm just we. Uh, it's funny I said we because it's the 42 voices in my head right, are saying right. it. Um, but yeah, we're thinking about that. So, but thank you again for joining us uh, once again. This has been another episode of Knocked Conscious. Please f subscribe, follow, rate, review. We love to hear you, Jeff. It's been an honor. It's just an amazing thing that uh, some of the accomplishments you've had, and I wish you much success in future. Endeavors. All right, Mark. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I hope we talk again. Thank you so much. Have a great day. And everyone else, thank you for joining us and take care. Once again, that was Jeff Hester, astrophysicist, and uh, once again, famous for his connection to the Hubble Space Telescope and all its amazing images. Thank you again, Jeff, for joining us. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Please subscribe follow, rate, and review us. We love to have some feedback. Uh, we do plan to have Jeff on uh, in the future as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them to info at knockedconscious.com. Once again, we appreciate any of uh, any rating review system that you could possibly give us. We'd love to hear some feedback. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great day.